Before I get into the sermon of the afternoon, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate Anna Holly and Dylan Canoni at their wedding this past Tuesday, December 12th. They'll be residing in spring, and the address and so forth will be given to Sonia, and she can get it into the bulletin and so on. This sermon this afternoon ties in with everything I've said and a whole lot more last Sunday in both sermons and this morning's sermon. I want to read to you, first of all, from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. We were in that this morning. Paul makes it very clear as to how it works, and you'll remember the sermon this morning, you'll You'll know we already touched on this, but I didn't refer to this one uh, passage. Paul writes, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. I think you recognize that these words form a solid foundation for the scriptural disposition of mind of every Christian when it comes to giving. In a practical way, we would like to notice a few things of this, the key words in this text before I go into some other matters. First of all, we need to realize the immutable relationship between our sowing and reaping when it comes to our giving. If we expend but little effort, shallow interest, all of that, of course, has to do with the Lord's work in being a Christian, and shall we say, miserly portions financially. Then you can mark it down. We will receive precious little in return for our efforts in the kingdom of Christ. And remember, we pointed out, because Paul did, that the reason the Macedonians in their poor state of affairs economically and other ways were able to give what they did give, though it was not likely as much as other places could give, they still surprised Paul with how much they gave. And he made it clear that they were able to do that because they first gave themselves. And that, of course, is the key to anything in Christianity, is that we give ourselves. If we give liberally of our energies, thoughts, and monetarily, then the Scripture promises that we shall reap abundantly. The statement which says you get as much out of it as you put into it is a pretty good statement to state the truth of the matter. And that's what Paul's saying regarding Christianity. I read this a while back, a preacher who had a friend, and you'll know this was a while back because it was back in the Depression of the 1930s. And he was preaching for a certain rural congregation. If you've ever visited with folks who grew up back then, you know times were rough. Now, it's true that a nickel and a dime and a quarter and 50 cents and a dollar would go very far in buying things in those days when they're contrasted with what those same amounts will buy today. So you didn't really have that much coming in, but it did buy a lot more, a lot more, or some more. And he pointed out he was preaching for a rural congregation, and he had to walk eight miles to get there to preach. And then, of course, he had to walk that same length back. Now, it may seem strange to some of you, but I, I still came along at a time when people were walking a lot of places that they don't walk today. I can remember Daddy liked to go to the ball games. We didn't have a car. 
and it was a couple of miles to where the high school football stadium was. You'd walk down Highway 7 and cut across what's still known today as the Mountain Holly Road and walk down it till you got to the high school, and behind the high school was the football stadium. And the roads would literally line with people on Friday night walking all the way up from what was the place where we lived and further and all the way there and all the way back. And people, my grandfather, all the time that he lived in that area, walked back and forth to work. People just walked a lot more. The roads were full of people walking. And we didn't have a car you could really trust until I think I was about 10, nearly 11 years old. So this man was saying that he walked that far to and from worship and they agreed to just give him the entire contribution. That would be what they would pay him for his preaching. One Sunday, the total was 68 cents. And he was given 33 of that. So we laugh about things like that. We don't run it, but that kind of thing happened all the time. I talked with preachers myself who started preaching back at that time. And what they were paid was just absolutely amazing. Now, I recognize again, I'll say it a third time, that the dollar went further than it does now. But it was still very little in compared to what we think of today and in all other aspects of society. I don't know why it sticks in my mind, but I was probably about five years old, give or take a year, and I went with Mother to buy groceries. And we went to a local place there, their son was a year behind me in school, Mr. Deadman. So we always joked about being a dead man's grocery. But his name was Deadman. And I remember, and I, you know, you wonder why things stick in your mind this way. Mother brought groceries. She had the thing full, just full of groceries, and had another one partially full. And Mr. Deadman walked us out to wherever. She had got a ride down there some way. And he was carrying two sacks in his arms with those buggies. And for some reason, he explained to me, I don't know, it was $14 or something. Uh, have you been to the grocery store this past week? You can spend $100 and not have hardly a, a sack full of stuff the way things are. So I understand the differences. And it would be even more so as far as the dollar buying more in the 1930s than it did in the early 1950s, the time I was relating to you. So I understand all of the differences in the buying power of, of the dollar and so forth and wages as far as what they are today from what they used to be. So in all seriousness, we shall and do reap as we sow in giving unto the Lord. The word purpose in our text is a very important word, purpose. The Greek word in this setting simply means to take beforehand to determine. And we've talked about that over the last two or three sermons. When I'm getting ready to worship God in my giving on the first day of the week, how do I purpose what I'm going to give? So giving to be acceptable must be planned giving. Well, how do I plan it? What's motivating me to plan my giving? How do I view my income? All these things enter in. And in regard to our financial contribution to the cause of Christ, then of course it means that we determine beforehand what we shall give. So we, you know, somebody says, uh, you did that on purpose. If you didn't give on purpose, you didn't give scripturally. So there must be thinking done behind the giving you do. So it's not impulse giving that we give. One of the things I remember in a place that I preached, one brother was saying we were discussing or something. He was teaching, he taught the auditorium class and he was teaching about giving. <laughs> He said, you know, when you travel, he said, even though you give like you ought to there at home, he said, you ever realize uh, 
that you need to set a good example when you're away by giving something. That's over and beyond what you purpose to give at home, and, and at home they depend on it. And uh, he said, you know, I think about when I'm traveling and I go into a building. Well, that building was there. It was bought by the church for the church to assemble in and do work out of. I go in to a warm or a cool building, whichever time of year it is. I sit on pews that are comfortable. I benefit from the preacher's preaching and the worship that was done. He said, you know, what I leave there with them in the contribution is what I purpose based upon, look what I enjoyed and had waiting on me there. And I need to do something about it. But I don't know that people think that way. So what would you do about that? Would you say you don't want to give anything? I'm, I'm simply saying that you need to think about ahead what you're going to give. The member of the church who fumbles around in his billfold or coin purse or purse trying to decide what to drop in the basket needs to learn what he said here about purposing. Because purpose is behind everything we do. Remember Paul said the Macedonians did what they did because they uh, gave themselves. Well, they had the purpose to give themselves. When a person obeys the gospel to become a Christian, they have the purpose to do that. It's not an impulse thing because they have to know what they're doing and why they're doing it. All of that's involved. So purpose is a part of everything we do in Christianity. And we're not to give grudgingly. I hate to do that. Uh, that's kind of how it is. I'll do it because I don't want anybody to think I don't, but I'd rather go buy a hot dog with it or whatever it is. <laughs> but some people here would go buy a gun or ammunition. <laughs> Something like that. But grudgingly is when you do it, but you just don't want to do it. Some donations might be received by the brethren, but never accepted by the Lord. Do you ever think about that? Received by the brethren, but not accepted by the Lord, simply because of the spirit behind them, the disposition of mind behind the giving of them. If we contribute hesitatingly or regretfully, we're really saying we're not converted. We're really saying we're not converted. It does take time to make the switch from being, I'll just be plain, from being a Scrooge or a tight wad to being what would be considered a generous giver. But mature, full-grown Christians must and will give of their means in a cheerful manner and they will be thinking about what they're going to give the next first day of the week as an act of worship in the preceding week. They'll be looking at what they've got. A Christian should have a higher and deeper motive than just giving out of necessity. We sing songs like that. That last song that we sang is trying to really say, have you considered what all heaven gave? Now, what are you giving? And I'm afraid that some of us would never obey a command of Christ if we really thought we could escape eternal damnation in a devil's hell without it. So when we're planning during the week and putting that back to give as an act of worship in the worship assembly on the first day of the week, and we must, if we're faithful, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, then that's not any different than singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and so forth. Or praying. We just as well not pray when we're led in prayer, or not sing when we're led to singing, or sleep through the sermon, or whatever it is, or look at your phone and read the, whatever you want to read, anything besides uh, the Bible. Or, you would know, well, that's, that's not right. Well, it's not right to give without purposing and giving as you prospered and giving cheerfully. And as I said this morning, growing in this grace also. So we should be a people of cheerful liberality. And it should be seen by all. And the church is expected to be financed by its members, by free will offerings. I want to mention some things about the spring congregation 
First of all, uh, if you've got your calendars ready or where you can put it into uh, whatever kind of electronic outfit you got, January the 7th, if the Lord wills, in 2024, not 2025, but 2024, January the 7th, we're going to have a special contribution. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you save up what you normally would give before and after so you can make a special contribution and give more that day and uh, rob it from the other days after or before. You're going to see in your own life what you can do that you probably don't even think you can do if you've given much thought about it. January 7th, 2024. Now understand, if you're dead or the Lord comes back, you don't have to worry about that. But if you haven't been giving like the Bible teaches you ought to give, you might ought to be concerned that you don't die the Lord comes back before you make some changes. You see, I can make that statement concerning other aspects of your life, and one way or the other, I do it all the time, and other preachers do too. We preach the gospel in its fullness about making any necessary changes to be right with God before your life ends, because you can't make those changes then. And you must stand before God to give an account of the deeds done in the body, and that's going to have to do with your giving. First of all, giving your life and everything with it. So January 7th, 2024, we're going to have a special contribution. Now, I want to just show you a few things that is weekly done or need, needed to use the monies that come in. Before I do that, I think you know that over the years, different people, even sometimes wills are given and money's given to the church. And the way it's been handled before I ever became an elder and even afterwards, it's it's put in its own fund so it can draw interest usually. Try to protect that as much as you can. But I'm talking about what goes weekly. My salary and my health insurance that the church has been paying for me for the time I've been here, which is now over 30 years. But it's now it comes to about, what is that, 61 260. So that's a, that's a year between Sonia and uh, Eric. And, of course, Eric gets the biggest salary of all. That comes to about fifteen ninety eight each week. And you come down to insurance on the building and utilities. That'll knock your block off as far as utilities are concerned. Comes down to how much was it? 15000 a year? I believe that's right. And you can see how much that would figure in a week if you just divide it. We do contribute to work in Kenya. And uh, then we also have the repairs and maintenance, which is always eating into things. We have some upcoming repairs. And that's going to cost something. The roof right now is going to probably cost, and this is an estimate, about $30,000. We've got so many cars running around and always the problem with thieves. We want to put gates over each side here and run a fence up and down, security fence. And that's going to be all together if you pull the, Roof and so forth, about $43,000 for all of that. It comes down to where really if we're giving every week like we ought to, it ought to be $2,500, $2,600 a week. That hasn't been happening. If you look at it as, with an accountant's eye, and that's the only way Ken knows how to look at anything, with the accountant's eye, <laughs> then uh, we're going in the hole. Now, again, 
I know there are people probably giving what they need to give. That's not the point. But I said this morning about that we're to grow in this grace also. I'll ask this. You'll have to answer it. Is God searches your mind? When's the last time you raised your contribution? Not, not when the last time you lowered it, but when's the last time you raised your contribution? I know we're a small number. But at the same time, if we're never challenged on anything, how are we going to do it? Uh, when we travel, do we hold back the money to give to the church when we get back? Or do we leave it here to give when we're not here? I couldn't say just how much everything is going to cost because you can't foresee all the particular things that there might be. I will say that if you have any questions, the elders are open to receive your questions or any particulars. We'd be glad to show you everything. What I'm talking about is every week's contribution just to take care of what's going on. And if you look around the building, especially on this side, you'll see work that needs to be done, but that doesn't even tell you about the flat roofs in this one. As well as things still back in the other building that hasn't even been finished yet. And I think probably there's as much good uh, stewardship practiced with the money we receive as any congregation around trying to handle it like it ought to be handled. Because the elders have to keep in mind that God knows how you're handling it. And you have a charge placed upon you not only when it comes to the funds that are contributed by the church, but also everything else that involves the work of the church. I'm quite sure, but I would say this in any place I've ever been, that the elders could make better choices than they have at times because they're human beings. But I know that uh, overall in the area of options, which is what they do their work in for the most part? What's the best option for carrying out and discharging this obligation that God and his authoritative words placed upon this congregation? That the elders take that in consideration and talk about it and think about a lot. And, you know, there's some people who may not make very much, but some of them probably outgive some who make more. There has to be a way that the elders can know what we can do. And as I say again, I'll emphasize it. If you want to know any details about any of the finances or whatever, you're encouraged to ask if you want to. But it comes down to this when you look at just what's out there every week. We are really going in the hole. Now, whether we can get up to that twenty-five or $2,600 a week, I don't know. But it's something to try. Now, back to January the 7th. You're not going to escape that. I'm going to challenge you today to double your contribution on that day. Now, some that's going to mean more than others, but I want to challenge you to do it. Now, let me emphasize this. If you can triple it, that'll be fine. If you can quadruple it, that'll be fine. But try to double it. You have to have a way of knowing you can do it. And you might be surprised how to change your view on giving on down the line. There has to be a way that you know. And you have to plan it. You have to purpose it. So you got January 7th ahead of you. And again, I want to say, don't hold back from what you're giving between now and then or after that. Just keep giving but plan this is a special situation to give a boost for the new year and to help by putting your money in the Lord's work now if Paul wasn't doing some of that as he wrote 2 Corinthians 8 I, I don't know and he did it in chapter 9 too I don't know what he was doing he was addressing the needs of the members of the church in the city of Corinth. If you look at the beginning of chapter, uh, or at the end of chapter 8, verse 24, it's sort of like we did this morning. 
He says, Wherefore show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. You know what he's saying? He said, we've been telling everybody what we can expect from you because we know what's there economically. We've been boasting to other churches about you. Well, lo and behold, a year ago you boasted, but you hadn't fallen through yet. But this is twice in what we have the same chapter, chapter that he talks about the proof of your love. Earlier he said to prove the sincerity of your love in verse uh, number 8. Now at the end of the chapter he says the same thing. Now if he could do that to a church then, we can do it to ourselves now. And the truth of the matter is, each one of us in purposing to give as we prosper cheerfully without grudging ought to do it every week. I don't know how you figure these things if you don't. And it causes us to think about them. But because giving is like it is, you know, we pull out the amount we give, we may have purposed it, we think that's it, and we just give it. It just kind of, here we go, here comes the plate and all this. But you don't do any other act of worship that way of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And it is an act of worship. And you know, that still doesn't remove for us the obligation. If on Tuesday you run across somebody that needs help, you can give them that help. And that's over and beyond what you purpose in your heart to give to the church and the work that's there. So we have all these different things. As I say, you can... Ask us, let me say it again, I say us as the elders, about the money, about all what is done with it, I'd be glad to tell you. But I think you'll be surprised if you'll make those plans and if you'll purpose between now and January 7th to do that. I think you'll just be surprised. Now, it's up to you, but you know, God searches our heart. God knows how much money you're going to spend over Christmas. And it's probably going to be quite a bit. When we did this one time many, many years ago, Dan Bjorn, Arkansas, the elders never had done anything like this. And they said, but that's Christmas. That's when everybody's going to be spending extra money for their kids, for travel, and for gifts, and for this, that, and the other. My answer to them was, yes, and that's when they'll be very conscientious if they're faithful Christians about doing the same thing for the Lord. And it's a good time to find out, I don't know how many times I've said this, to see what you can do and will do. So I'm leaving this with you. I'll be mentioning that January 7th, 2024, quite often. And I want to encourage you to make your plans between now and then to see what we can do in doubling our contribution at least on that day. Now, I see, again, uh, it wouldn't bother me if you want to give a lot and want to go down to the bank and make a loan and give it. I, that's fine. People don't believe you can do that kind of thing. Well, the church can go borrow money, build a building, and borrow money, and give to other things too. But we don't think that way, do we? It's got to be earned by me. I could never borrow money and, and give it to the church. Well, I found out a long time ago when I was telling Jody, just next year it'll be 50 years since we built that building in Van Buren. And the church issued at that time $100,000 worth of bonds through a bonding company. And they had a certain way they would raise that money. They would start on, they did it in seven days. They'd start on Sunday afternoon and call all the church together to give them the first access to all of the, the bonds because they would mature at different uh, rates and different uh, whatever, different times, different amounts. And they gave the church the opportunity to do that. Well, you know, I don't know whether you realize it back in those days, uh, interest was very high. And church bonds are always a thing that... Uh, I always had pretty high interest compared to other things. I don't know what that would be today. So they did. And I think the elders almost had a heart attack. Because out of that $100,000, that little congregation, country congregation, that afternoon they got together. I think they met at three. I believe that's when we gathered. $100,000. 
We dismissed it a few minutes after. And they had sold half of them to the congregation. But now what's interesting about that is I can remember some of those bonds paying 14.5% interest. You know, brethren didn't have a problem at all to see the, that. They could see we put our money here, this much comes back and saves going to the bank and all that stuff. If you know anything about how things are financed like that, and that's how they built the building there. Why is it we think like we think? I don't know. Except people will think when it comes to money like they will never think any other way if they think at all. I don't know why. I just don't. But I do know the first sin in the early church was about money. And that ought to tell us something. Well, I'm going to close here. I didn't go into a whole lot of details because I decided after I saw what Ken wrote in his shorthand, and that takes effort itself to work on reading. <laughs> but I can read it. I just had to say that because it's his shorthand. <laughs> but I can read it, but I want you to feel free to come to the elders if you want to ask about or see anything about the finances. And so we're always glad to do that. But I want us to realize that we do need to think about this and there needs to be a challenge made to each one of us to make sure we're faithful to God in our giving. You ever think about that? Am I faithful to God in my giving? When I worship God on the first day of the week in the area of my giving, am I as exacting on that as I am when it comes to making sure I'm worshiping God in music correctly? or in prayer. It all fits in the same thing. And remember, I close with this, that one of the interesting things was that Jesus one time sat over against the treasury just watching people put their money in it. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think he still sits over against the treasury and watches what people put into it? Well, I think he does. And we need to, as Christians of Christ, in view of all that heaven's done for us and still doing, think about that. So I'm reminding you again, January the 7th, 2024, try to follow through with this and see what happens. If you double your contribution, I promise you, the world won't explode over that anyway. If you double your contribution, or if you triple it, whatever you do, I can't promise you that the Israeli war will end. <laughs> I can't promise you anything like that. But I can promise you Jesus is over against the treasury, knowing how you're thinking and I'm thinking and our purposing and our giving cheerfully, and it will amount to something. According to what I've read in my Bible, sowing sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. That's true of the money you give, your life, your study, your worship. And some of us haven't got very long left on this earth. And then a great, vast eternity opens up of which there's no end and totally unlike what we have here. But how we lived here, what we did with what we've got, will make a difference in the there and then. If you're not a child of God, we invite you to become a Christian this afternoon by obeying Christ's plan of salvation. We ask you to seriously consider it. Because you're giving your life to Christ. That means you're going to follow him. You're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing all these things you're bad unto you. That you must believe that he is the son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, as we do every time, we should be sifting through our mind in all honesty and objectivity and in the knowledge of the truth and saying, am I living like the Bible says? If I find areas in my life that I'm not, I need to repent of those, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. But the big thing is this. Be steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.